Hello, today we're going to look at revisiting feature prediction for learning visual representations from video, also known as the paper that introduces the model VJEPA. VJEPA is a derivative or a variant of the JEPA architecture that was originally proposed by Jan Lacan as on the built on the hypothesis of feature prediction being a very good tool to do unsupervised learning from data. We're going to dive into all of that. We're going to dive into what the model does, what it can do. But in essence, in a short form, this is an unsupervised techniques to learn good features from in this case from video data. And by good features, we mean latent features that you can then use to make downstream tasks better. Like, for example, if you want to do video classification, you could use a model that's pre trained using VJEPA, and then fine tune it to do some sort of topic classification, fine tune it to do some extraction of of stuff and so on. So that is the, the base case for this model. Think of it like BERT, uh, but for video, no, in, in a in a way but also a bit different, but in terms of what you can do with it. Uh, so we're going to first take a tiny look at the original JEPA paper, just to get you in the mood of what the underlying sort of core hypothesis of this is. And then we're going to dive into this paper. Actually, I want to look at the abstract of this paper in the very first place and then dive into the, the JEPA paper. So they say humans possess remarkable ability to map low level signals originating from the retina into semantic spatial temporal understanding of the world. Uh, so you know, recognizing objects, recognizing global motion, and so on, all from various pixel movements that are very localized, this ability to understand video in this case, like like streaming image data of your eyes and brain is incredibly difficult to match with machines. A longstanding goal of the machine learning community is to identify the principles or objectives that may guide such unsupervised learning in humans. So the question is, how do humans do that? How do humans extract from this pixel movement, these high level things? And how do humans learn to do that? Right? How to how does certainly you can argue someone has a built in ability to do some of this stuff. But still, you need to learn all the objects that exist in the world, a lot of them haven't existed for all of evolution. So there must be a mechanism by which humans in an unsupervised way acquire this knowledge. The hypothesis they're going with here is the so called predictive feature principle which posits that representations of temporally adjacent sensory stimuli should be predictive of each other. What does that mean? That means representations should, we're dealing with representation. So we're not dealing with signals themselves. We're dealing with representations of signals. And in our current language, that would be latent space embeddings. So this is the first indication we are not operating in pixel space right here, we are always going to abstract from the pixel space and whatever we do, we do in the latent space. So there's not going to be a pixel reconstruction error here or anything like this, um, or a auto regressive synthesis of data or something like this, all of what we do here happens in the latent space, then temporally adjacent sensory sensory stimuli, um, meaning video frames that follow each other or, you know, the left side of the video and the right side of the video and things like this, they should be predictive of each other, meaning that if I know one of them, I can predict not the other part of the video, but the representation of the other part of the video. So if I see kind of like half a dog ish, then I can predict oh probably the other half of the dog is going to be in the other half of the video. Or if I see, I don't know, I see like a, a road um, in the beginning of the video, I may may predict that there's going to be a car driving on the road at the end of the video, that would be one possible future. Right? So this hypothesis that humans may in part learn to extract meaningful features of the of in an unsupervised fashion of video data 
is based on so the hypothesis that that is based on this principle that humans learn to associate representations of video like things that appear at the same time or after each other in video to associate representations with each other and to predict representations from each other. They say we revisit feature prediction, sorry about that, as a standalone objective for unsupervised learning of visual representations from video. The goal here isn't to get the best model ever. The goal is to say how far can we get with just unsupervised learning uh, of of representations uh, based on the on the principle that we the principle of feature prediction, right, the principle that we just discussed. They say, in this case, we present video joint embedding predictive architecture VJEPA, which is based solely on feature prediction without using pre trained image encoders, text, negative examples, human annotations or pixel level reconstruction. So this means this alleviates a number of things, no need for negative examples, negative examples are very common in unsupervised representation learning. Think how do you how do you learn an embedding model in an unsupervised fashion? Well, you have two sentences that are close to each other. And then you have a third one that's far apart, and you push these together and this one apart, you always have to take care of how, how far away should you push those like, you know, how close is too close, and then you want to start mining hard negatives, right? Because the task quickly becomes too easy. So you want like, okay, I want to find negative samples that are kind of close, but not really, and then push those apart. There are lots of problems with having negative samples. Um, pre trained encoders obviously also help, they also don't want to use that human annotations are very costly, and pixel level reconstruction, as we will see the theme here of this paper is that the method here VJEPA is going to be much more efficient um, at reaching certain goals than pixel based methods. So it's not that pixel based methods don't work. It's just that they seem to waste a lot of computation, a lot of parameters and so on at doing just a local pixel level stuff. So they can really get those pixels, right? VJEPA just doesn't care about the pixels, it purely operates in the latent space and therefore can denote uh, devote a much more extensive budget, let's say, to uh, getting those latent features correct. Alright, so I would be remiss, maybe you've seen it already. Um, I've already talked about it in the last video, but there is a new course by weights and biases, which uh, happily um, graciously sponsor this video. So thanks a lot. The course is on structured outputs of LLMs, uh, not exactly VJEPA like, but if you want to put two LLMs together, if you want to build agent systems, or, or just kind of chain LLM calls together, it's really useful if the intermediate representation isn't just text, but is actually structured, like think the first call extracts some stuff from text, and then the second call does something useful with each thing you extracted. JSON is very popular in between formats. So this course is going to teach you how to get the first one to output solid JSON, and then how to use libraries based on Pydantic. If you know that there are libraries that adapt Pydantic and to uh, LLM output to essentially parse out the necessary information and validate whether the LLM has actually given you something that's valid and, and correct, not correct in the semantic sense, but correct in the JSON sense, it's yeah, I actually expected a number here that's, you know, between 100 and 1000, and so on. So this is a huge issue with chaining multiple LLMs together. And these techniques are going to help you greatly. So they take you from the basics, like how do I prompt uh, LLMs to give me structured output and so on, up until how do I uh, validate them? How do I use libraries that already exist in order to validate those things? If you're interested, course is completely free. Uh, and yeah, that's a great price, as they say. So let's go back to um, let's go to 
the JEPA paper, like the original paper that introduces this architecture. And I don't want to hang around here too much because I've already made a video about this, which you can go look up. But the basic uh, gist, the basic architecture of JEPA, and there's going to be a lot of diagrams here. Let's pay attention that we don't skip the, we may have already skipped the most important. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, the, the basic principle is going to be is going to be the following. Can we design systems that uh, have the blue thing here? That's a data point, for example, a video, many frames of a video, right? Um, or it can be a piece of text, it can be an image, it can be multimodal, whatnot. The question is, uh, can we design systems that if they know one part here, um, they can predict the other part or in a different formulation, can we design systems that have what, what is called an energy function that um, can determine whether or not two things go together. So in this sense, imagine this is the beginning of a video and this is the continuation. Can we build systems that are good at recognizing whether or not y is actually a valid continuation of x? And we formulate it like this, because if you think about it, for the for any beginning of a video, there are obviously infinite possibilities of how the video can continue. There are like most of them, if you enumerate them, most of them will just be random pixel noise. So that's not, you know, all of that is obviously invalid. But then there's also infinite possibilities of how even a natural looking video could continue. And only some of them actually make sense. Only some of them are, let's call them valid or probable continuations of a video. So if I see, I don't know, a car driving down the road, it would be very good to, um, to assume, yeah, okay, maybe that car should continue driving down the road, maybe it should make a turn to the left, make a turn to the right, all of these would be valid continuations. However, a car driving down the road, and then in the next instance, I don't know, there's like some Disney character jumping up and down, that would be, you know, very, uh, not, not continuing the current video. And therefore, um, we would say that's not a, that's not a kind of a valid continuation. So can we build systems that can recognize when two parts of a data point or a collection of data points go together well or not, and we call that an energy function. Uh, detecting that is a, a base for these systems. And you can see we, we're not only talking about beginning of video or end of the video, we can do various things. But they all revolve around masking out some part of the masking out some part of the data, and then trying to predict that part from other parts of the data, or respectively trying to build an energy function that tells us whether or not the whether or not any given mask filling is compatible with the data we already know. This can be then formalized. Um, so if you want f, we, we already seen, okay, to any given x, there could be many, many different y that um, minimize the function or achieve a, a low value or a high value, respectively, what you want. And this can be abstracted uh, by introducing a z, which is a kind of a selector variable. This is a latent variable that encapsulates how x and y are related. For example, in the example before, when you see a car driving, let's assume there are only three like valid continuations, there's like left turn straight and right turn, z could encapsulate uh, the choice of which turn to make. And therefore, if I know z, then it is very defined, which y would minimize the energy function in that sense. So this allows me to sort of account for the fact that there are many different possibilities of going with a given x, um, because I can latently make uh, the choice and embed the choice in z um, in order to to determine which y is a good one. We do that mostly because of, for example, um, if I now train a system, if I train a system with this, and, and that doesn't account for this, let's say I have 
I don't know, a billion videos, and they all start somehow. And just two videos, they happen to start the same way, right? Could be, could be. But in one video, the car does a left turn, in one video, the car does a right turn. If I just train these systems with, I don't know, cross entropy, I just train them with pixel L2 loss, something like this, right? Or even with with the JEPA here with like, um, only predicting the features strictly, then what is going to happen is the loss, which is ultimately like the mean loss of over all the samples will, will kind of do a wish, like we'll kind of do an overlap, a blend uh, between the all the possibilities right here, but that's not desirable. We want the loss to be clean and crisp for the particular choice we make right now, and then clean and crisp for the other choice. And we don't want it to be like the, the mean, the pixel mean, or the feature mean or whatever of the different samples. A lot of architectures actually have a problem like this. I, I believe notably, uh, variational autoencoders are quite famous for being blurry, at least in the original formulation. And one part of that could be because uh, they don't account for this thing in the loss part of their of their equation. So I might I might I might talk crap here but I believe that was one of the reasons. All right, so here we can already see the, the first um, first like ingredient that we're going to see later in these JEPA models. Then next, if we talk about unsupervised feature learning, right? Um, again, the classic example is something like learning text embedding models where we have two sentences, like where we have just a bunch of text and we want to learn some similarity function, like some embedding that then is can be used to do text similarity, or something like clip, right, where we have uh, a, an image and a text that sort of sometimes go together. But the question is, obviously, how do we learn this robustly, we already discussed negatives. So if I have text, 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 right, and then text over here. So I, I'm going to take two sentences, one here, and one that follows that immediately, I'm going to take a sentence over here. And they use these as positive examples, and these here as negative examples. And we already discussed that that has some disadvantages. So I would like to leave away, not, not do negative examples. Now, the problem here is, that if I only have positive examples, that can collapse uh, my learning pretty quickly. So if I just make, like, let's say I, I uh, randomly initialize some BERT model or something, and I just I push this sentence through it, and I push this sentence through it, and I just say these two should be similar, right? Just these two should be similar. Um, what it will do is it will force the loss will guide my model to just always output a constant like constant vector of zeros, because if well, if this I put the constant vector of zeros, and this outputs a constant vector of zeros, they are always equal, right. But so is everything else. But my loss, my, my loss, I only ever have positive examples. So we call that collapse um, in this sense. And we're wondering what can we do in order to prevent collapse in this domain of unsupervised feature learning, without negatives. And uh, the paper lists a few variants here of how that's usually done and their propensity for collapsing. None of these are JEPA, but they kind of are stepping stones along the way. So here you can see um, one architecture, what we do is we have x and y, which are again, the two, two pieces two separate pieces, but of the same data point, right. So we want to relate x and y together. Um, we encode x, so we build a representation. And yeah, also, our ultimate goal is to build an encoder. Right? Our ultimate goal is to after we've done all this training, extract this part, or this or this respectively. So it's paramount that we always think, you know, what, what does this particular training mean for the encoder. So here, uh, we have x, we encode x, which gives us s of x, which is the latent representation, and y, and then we try to predict y directly, 
Right? So this could be I give you the beginning of a video and you just give me I encode it. And from the latent representation, you give me the pixels of the continuation of the video. And then I compare that with the actual pixels. And then I have some loss function right here. Now, that is an autoencoder, not an autoencoder, but ish, right? Like it's beginning of the video to end of the video, sort of just prediction. Um, that works. But again, it wastes a lot of time and effort on really getting the pixels correct. Plus, it obviously does not have this property that it can account for one beginning of the video going into multiple valid directions. This will just the loss itself will just assume there is one correct thing to do. And if I have two different data samples, same beginning, but different continuations, then that's just kind of noise. It, it like must be that, like, I'll, I'm just going to take the mean because that that is giving me the least amount of loss. So cannot collapse, which is a good thing, right? I act, I actively always predict the pixels, which means my loss back propagation will always go to the encoder, give me valid good encoding right here. However, um, we have all these other disadvantages. Okay, generative latent variable architecture here, we actually account for the fact um, of this, of this choice of the fact that different like the same video can continue in different ways. You can see we have a this variable z, which can incorporate that choice, how we train it. Uh, different question, actually, that question becomes interesting. Now, so you see, the encoder now gives us a representation. And the predictor, the part that predicts that tries to reconstruct from the encoding of x, the y, the pixels, now also gets that choice. So now also gets, hey, what choice did we actually make? If you think of how you train these things, again, we're wasting a lot of time and effort on the pixels right here. But we're also asking, can this collapse? And yes, it can collapse. How can it collapse? The model can just decide to in in Z, essentially put all information in Z and no information into S of x. So you can just learn how that's exactly done. You, you know, that it's a different question, if you will, but it can just always learn to put a lot of information into Z. And um, then only predict y from z and never predict y from s of x and therefore s of x doesn't get a good gradient and therefore the encoder doesn't get a good gradient and therefore collapse. All right, we also have autoencoder, autoencoder, uh, here can, as far as I know, also collapse in the sense that, well, how can it collapse? You can probably just output some sort of static, static output right here, like we see a lot of crucial elements missing. And then we have the joint embedding architecture. And this one is a real big candidate for collapsing. Um, why? Because you can see right here, we're not predicting the pixels anymore. So we're trying to save ourselves and saying, Hey, let's not predict the pixels. Pixel prediction wastes a lot of energy on exactly the pixels. Let's predict from the features of x, let's predict the features of y. Right? Um, in fact, we have a uh, where does this come from? Well, there should probably be some predictor in between in between here, I guess or this should just be s of x and s of y. Maybe we just we just do this on the uh, on the two embeddings. But in any case, even if we had a predictor right here, you can obviously see the danger that what we said before, if we encode x and encode y, and we always output a constant vector, then that distance is always going to be minimal. And therefore, we the loss of the model is super small, yet we did not learn a useful representation. Okay. The, the thought of predicting the latent features is really good, because it means if we can predict s of y from s of x, well, that would mean we exactly fulfill the hypothesis, hey, late, like predict, 
representations of one part of the data should be able to predict representations of the other part of the data. That's how we know we have good representations. However, that those representations must also be informative about the data and not collapse to nothingness because otherwise prediction is super easy, but it doesn't mean anything. So that's why the ultimate architecture is going to look something like this incorporating all of these things. So um, we're going to have an encoder here uh, that gives us a representation, we're going to have this choice variable that goes into the predictor, the predictor then predicts the latent representation of y. And then we have a distance metric here. Um, there is going to be two modifications to that. First of all, this here is not going to be trained using backpropagation. This is actually going to be a moving average of the encoder over here. And that moving average that has been very uh, successful in other works that don't use negatives for representation learning, such as bootstrap your own latent and so on, where you just have you have two encoders, essentially one for x, one for y, but you don't train y, the y is just a moving average of the weight of x. So it's always kind of behind, which makes sure that it's always a, a little bit different uh, from <laughs> different from the encoding of x, but it's still kind of a valid encoding. Right? So you're trying to keep the encoding this the same enough, so that obviously the predictor can make sense out of it and actually predict something sensible. But you're also trying to make it different enough so that it so that it's not encouraged to just always output a constant value. Because as soon as this part here would realize, ah, this part here is essentially the same as me, I'm just gonna output a constant value. And therefore, this thing here will output a constant value and therefore prediction is really easy, right? So you want to make them different enough for the part over here not to realize that. And re by realize, I mean, recognize it through gradient flow. Um, and the second of all, yeah, I already said this is a moving average. So there is no gradient training here. So there's gonna be a stop gradient going back here, though the gradient flow is only going this way. So the encoder that's being trained is on the left hand side right here. And then the moving average will build the encoder on the right hand side. And therefore, if you time it correctly, if you get the hyperparameters correctly, you can prevent collapse while having good representation learning. You can also slap a bunch of regularizers on stuff. Uh, notably, you can slap a regularizer on z to minimize information content, you can slap regularizers on x and y and so on. And there are various derivatives of this, uh, some of which are mentioned in this paper, like regularizing covariance matrices on and so on, to make things more regular. But now let's dive actually into the v jeppa paper. Um, so the I already mentioned the uh, outcome of this is going to be feature prediction can indeed serve as an effective standalone objective for unsupervised learning from video while using significantly shorter training schedules than pixel prediction methods. So this is going to give a versatile visual, visual representation, meaning we get a model that can take in a video and give us features that we can use for downstream tasks or that we can super uh, fine tune for downstream tasks. Um, it's superior to pixel prediction approaches if it's either better in terms of uh, numbers, like in towns downstream task numbers, or it matches the downstream tasks numbers while being faster to train more label efficient and so on. So if you have some labels, it's also more label efficient than pixel based approaches. Cool. So this is the, the base architecture here, there's going to be x and y, which are two different parts of the same video, what they often do is they'll block out like a large part of the video for the entire duration of the video. And then only from the other parts, trying to predict not the pixels, but the representation of the pixels, right. So the predictor is going to get the encoding of x plus this uh, choice variable z the, the variable z during training here needs to be constructed by hand. So by hand, we need to say how are x and y related. In this case, this is going to be uh, they, they denote that as delta y, delta y is simply the position of the thing to predict. So if you have the video frame, and you blacken out all of this stuff, and then maybe some of this stuff as well, the uh, positions 
of of these are going to be delta y right because if you if you just run these parts here through the encoder you just get some encoded um, signal right and then by using this information you can more precisely predict what's going what's here and what's here because you know kind of where it is in relation to what you have seen of the video so this acts as z in this case it's not a perfect z in terms of the um of jeppa because it doesn't encapsulate this what i said before well the same video could continue in two different ways and so on it doesn't encapsulate that a uh, perfect z would account for that uh, but also coming up with such a z during training time is obviously very hard and if you don't do that you need to do kind of training inference time optimization or something like this or, or learn something so this is a a substitute to at least give the predictor a little bit of information how it should take the representation of the things that it can see and predict the representation of the thing that it cannot see so you see it predicts s of y which is yeah the representation so not the pixels themselves but the latent features of the masked out parts of the video and then there's going to be an l1 loss i think so here you can see uh, the objective is this one right here we're going to minimize the um we're going to encode x and then predict the encoded features of y uh, l1 loss across that and then jointly train the predictor and the embedder and to prevent collapse we're going to modify it like this we're going to add a stop gradient to the y direction and we're going to add a moving average so we're going to construct the y encoder to be a moving average of the x encoder and the l1 regression is just a choice to make it more stable they have some theoretical motivation for doing the whole moving average thing um, that they adapt from a different paper essentially what it boils down to when you do the whole math is they say look if we assume the optimal predictor here then calculate the gradient for the encoder and the gradient for the encoder is what you want to pay attention to because if there is collapse then the gradient of the encoder would be independent of the data right that that's what collapse means um that the encoder is independent of the data and therefore during training you would expect to see the gradient of the encoder becoming independent of the data but you can see here under some assumptions they can actually closed form calculate that gradient and you can see here it does in fact uh it does in fact contain the data here and therefore it will depend on the data which will mean that the encoder learns from the data and doesn't collapse again uh, so this um they say incorporating an exponential moving average to compute the representation of y ensures that the predictor evolves faster than the encoder and remains close to optimal thereby preventing collapse so good we'll just take it as it is you can dive deeper if you want but it is more of a justification not a, a proof let's say this is going to be the actual um architecture of vjepa right here so starting from the left hand side sorry i cannot really zoom much more here we are going to make the video into patches uh, patches and tokens are going to be synonyms in in this form patches are going to be 16 by 16 pixels so 16 by 16 pixels for two frames so two consecutive frames 16 by 16 pixels so it's a it's kind of a volume of that's a terrible volume a volume of pixels so two frames next to each other the same 16 by 16 pixels that's in total 512 pixels that's a one token okay. uh, they already train with frame skip by the way so uh yeah but two consecutive tokens uh two consecutive frames give, give you one uh, patch then they mask out 
you can see right here first they they patch the image uh, the video sorry after by the way after you have patched it you just unroll it right so 16 by 16 by 2 you make these little groups everywhere uh, through the time dimension as well always grouping two together and then you just unroll it so you have just one long series of these tokens and once you have that you can lay them out and you can essentially treat it as a as a, a, a language problem uh, if you will so you're going to mask out and by masking out they don't just mask out random tokens they as you can see right here they always so this this is the time dimension here they always pay attention that they actually mask out continuous blocks over the of a video over the so the same regions across time which makes the problem a little bit harder because if you just randomly mask out patches you can easily just go to the next like two frames ahead and then all of the th stuff is visible and because in most video there isn't that much movement from frame to frame you have a really easy time predicting stuff around so blocking out sort of continuous pieces of data makes it harder for makes it harder to solve the problem so the masked we only retain what is unmasked we push that through the encoder so we have an encoded uh, series right here now that the little d here i think that's just a mistake that th that this is always the same um kind of makes no sense because here it should be 512 right because each patch each token is 512 dimensions and then here it's they say at one point it's like 384 ish I'm not sure so um, pay no attention to that that's probably just paper writing uh, sloppiness I guess or or hand wavy but it, in essence we come out with a series of like a latent encoding of these of the unmasked parts of the video then we fill in they say concatenate mask tokens we actually fill in mask tokens for the regions we want to predict so each of these blue squares they they add, they come through an attention mechanism so they do technically have global information like any of these blue like, of these tokens can contain global information but still they kind of correspond to a given unmasked patch in the original video right um like every last layer BERT token still corresponds to a token in the input even though there's no necessity to do that except of course the the loss function so we're going to insert the part tokens for the parts of the video that we have masked and these are just going to be initialized with a learned masked embedding and some positional encodings and then the predictor is going to predict the embeddings of y right and it knows what to predict first of all by the you know mask tokens but um no just by the mask tokens so this whole delta y that information is now inside of the mask token if i if i understand that and the code correctly the what they before called delta y is inside of the mask token because the information of where the regions are you want to predict compared to the regions that you know those are in the positional encodings of the mask token um, so the predictor here has technically access to the blue stuff which is whatever comes from x and the red stuff which includes the delta y right here so it's exactly as we saw before and then it tries to predict s of y here um, on the other hand we're going to take the same video so over here same video as as here uh, and we're going to just run it through the y encoder remember y encoder is an exponentially moving average of this thing right here and you notice we're going to encode all the tokens and that gives us what they call concept contextualized targets meaning that everything can attend to everything and therefore the thing to predict um has kind of information about all the stuff right uh so these are these are the these are the actual embeddings that you would get if you were to embed the whole data point so that's important masking after the encoding so after encoding you mask this part and obviously you need to do the anti-mask so you need to retain 
all the stuff that you um, have masked out over here because those are exactly the targets. So the, the red ones, the red squares here, the mask tokens are exactly specifying which parts you need to predict. The predictor predicts those. You can see we're going from L to M. M, so L equals to N plus M here. Uh, N is what we push through X. M is what we push through or what we get from Y. And then there is an L1 loss. And then we just train back propagate through the predictor to the encoder, the encoder exponentially moving average over here, there is a stop gradient here. And that's the whole architecture on the beam but the boom. Also, this is a really machine learning heading predicting y from x. Thank you. Thank you. For that that's very informative. Um, yeah, so you can read a little bit more into that exactly what I found interesting is actually that they have an average masking ratio of 90%. So the masking, so the x is usually just about 10% of the video in itself. Sorry, I was interrupted during the making of this video, it is now about one hour later. Uh, so I have no clue where we left off. But we have gone over the the big part of this, like the architecture, the motivation, and so on, you can see a bit more details into network parameterization. Uh, there are two different networks here. One is the uh, encoder, and that's just the a vision transformer as a video backbone. And as you saw, the video clip is split into a 3d grid consisting of 16 by 16 pixel blocks spanning two consecutive frames. They say we refer to these spatiotemporal patches as tokens. Then they say uh, how they mask. The predictor is a narrow transformer implemented using 12 blocks with an embedding dimension of 384. And by the way, contrary to most big companies, uh, this being meta, they actually release big tables with all the hyperparameter numbers in the appendix. So this like one giant compliment to the researchers here, this is actually a paper that you could conceivably reproduce. Um, they describe what data they use, they describe the hyperparameter, they describe the model architecture, like pretty much anything except like what the exact hidden dimension is. Although I have the feeling they just left whatever vit like whatever vit h and and vit l have as a hidden dimension, they just left that as it was, and they just use that. So conceivably, this is totally reproducible, apart, of course, from hardware requirements, which they just say, like a 180 gigabytes, but I have no clue if it's if that means one a 180 gigabytes, or just like a whole lot of them. And that's just the type that we used no idea. But <laughs> um, someone calculated it and, you know, calculated that they would use at least 16 of them or something like this. But I feel you can always do some offloading and reduce that down it depends. In any case, they do operate with fairly high batch sizes here. And I feel high batch sizes are also one of the things that certainly help if you're doing these unsupervised, um, unsupervised representation learning methods without negatives, because the large batches, they will kind of smoothen out gradients and so on. Um, although maybe that's not even desired. Interestingly, they say each model takes as input a video clip of 16 frames sampled with a frame skip of four, corresponding to roughly three second clips on average. So this is 30 same frames per second uh, video. So frame skip of four, you take 16 frames of that, you have to see roughly three second clips. So the um, 16 frames would give you, you would split up into 16 by 16 by two patches. And uh, the original resolution, I believe they also have that here somewhere. The original resolution is 224 or 384. Um, and that will give you the number of patches and the number of patches I think is about 1500 patches in one data 
point and then they do 2400 data points or 3072 data points depending on the model per batch so not inconceivably large but it is you know fairly chunky i don't want to go too much into the uh into the experimental into the exact numbers right here um, but we can go a bit through the main conclusions the results of this comparisons indicate that predicting in feature space provides a consistent performance improvement over pixel space prediction in both frozen evaluation of the video backbone as well as end-to-end fine-tuning. So they compare it to methods that try to predict the pixels and not the hidden representations and they find the ones that predict the hidden representations to be more performing when they use the trained encoders for downstream tasks. Again, the you cannot evaluate these models in isolation because they're not like next token predictors in sense of they don't predict the input data or something like this they're not generative so the way you evaluate them is you take the encoder that you've trained the encoding part and then you use it for a downstream task and if you do that then they tend to be better than pixel based methods they also investigate data mixes um, and masking strategies, which masking strategies are better than other masking strategies. And I want to kind of skip over that, but you can see right here, you can achieve um, similar results as other models, like here, here, you can achieve similar results in various tasks. However, the amount of samples seen can be reduced drastically. So either it is better than other methods or it is more label efficient given the uh, similar performance. And yeah, that bodes really well for this model. One interesting thing is the way they qualitatively evaluate this. So they go ahead and say, okay, we got some numbers, but we wanna actually investigate what kind of stuff the encoder actually learned. What's these these features that are extracted by this purely feature prediction objective, what do they actually contain? So in order to do that, they train a decoder. Now, this is actually going to go back to the pixel space, as you can see right here. But this is only for inspection. This is only for evaluation. So the way they do it, they mask out a piece of data, they pass it through the encoder. So you get encoded. Uh, tokens, as you see right here, they pass that through the predictor. The predictor predicts the latent features of the missing part of the masked part. And now all of this, that's VJEPA, right? So they do that. Um, that's pre-training. And then this is completely frozen. So frozen. And then they train the decoder. They train the decoder to reconstruct the original pixels given only given only the predicted latent representation of the masked parts of the video. So this decoder does not have access to any of the data that's around here. So usually if you were to do a good mask filling decoder or something like this, you actually give it access to all the pixel around here so it can do a, a good matching boundary and so on. But here they explicitly don't want that because they wouldn't know if, if the pixels in here are good. They wouldn't know if it was predicted from the pixels around it or actually from these features that are learned. So they specifically only take into account the latent representation uh, the predicted latent representation of the masked region. As you can see right here, anything in the blue square that's decoded from this model. And you can see that it matches up fairly well with what could be in the video. Obviously, the boundaries aren't perfect. But the sort of arrangement of things, the objects that are in and the general, sorry, the general locations of stuff is valid. And so this and this and this, these are three different uh, decodings of the video, as far as I can can tell. And you can see, yeah, that they're, they're pretty much they're pretty much pretty good, and do are all quite plausible in terms of what's contained. Again, boundary artifacts are completely expected 
in this uh, type of evaluation. So this is it. This is VJEPA. Uh, tour through the paper. They have an extensive appendix that you can go look with more details with tables and hyperparameters and so on. Much, much appreciated. So all everyone give one clap for Meta. Yay. Good job. All right. That was it for me. I do think this is a really cool uh, direction, unsupervised learning and getting the sort of grasping the principles behind it uh, is remains very important. And that's that. Uh, stay hydrated. See you around. Bye-bye.